out on alert. So uh, just and so you know, recording? everybody. Yes, I'm about to record. Just <laughs> so everybody knows, uh, I am going to be recording this session. Uh, so if that is, if you feel uncomfortable about that and you do want to leave, you can always tune in on our YouTube session as well. Uh, you just look up jack.org on YouTube and you will find uh, that stream there. We just started it up. Uh, hello, everybody on the live stream over there. Um, but I hope you don't mind. So I'm going to click this record button. Thank you very much for letting everybody know. A little bit redundant. I did already tell them. Uh, but let's get this PowerPoint up and going and get the presentation going. So uh, without further ado, I would like to throw it over to my wonderful colleague, uh, Carla Sutton, who is going to kick us off with a fantastic land acknowledgement. Uh, Carla, step on up. Thanks, Lee. Hi, everyone. It's it's so good to have you here. Thanks for, for joining us tonight. Um, before we go any further, I'm going to dive into a land acknowledgement. Um, so I wish to acknowledge this land on which I currently occupy in Tecoronto. Since immor immemorial, it has been the traditional land of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I also acknowledge that this land is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I invite you to reflect on the land that you find yourself on today uh, and what this means for you and the Indigenous peoples who came before you. Um, and I gave this land acknowledgement recently. And at this point in the land acknowledgement, I paused. And I think that's important. Um, and hopefully this doesn't come across as patronizing, but I've done some a, a bit of research on land acknowledgements. Um, some of those articles and some of that research has been done by Indigenous peoples and, and many people agree that that first section that I just um, presented, I'll call it part A, while it's important, it's less important than the second piece that I'm about to get into. Um, and the second piece is, is my personal commitment to reparation. And the second piece should be unique to you and, um, and requires some reflection. Um, so my, my part B, um, as a settler on this land, it is my responsibility to identify the ways in which colonization has imposed rigid and often harmful structures and systems, many of which are difficult to see and many of which I actually benefit from and commit to unraveling these structures and the beliefs and behaviors that go along with them. In doing so, I commit to speaking up, even when it's uncomfortable and inconvenient. I commit to listening um, to recognizing and appreciating when it's not my turn to speak up and continuing to learn from and about those who were here before me. I commit to using my privilege to not only raise awareness for the barriers and inequities that Indigenous peoples continue to face, but to also celebrate their strength, their loyalty and commitment to their community and to protecting the earth. Um, also their kindness, even as wrongdoings continue and as apologies come way too late, um, I commit to an ongoing practice of self-reflection, um, strengthening my self-awareness to expand my understanding beyond just one way of being, and to better understand what damaging beliefs and perspectives I hold, and how I actually contribute to the continued, of, continued oppression of Indigenous peoples. I support the rights of Indigenous peoples and the continuous work that communities are doing to advocate for self-determination, self-governance, and equity. Thank you. Back to you, Lee, I believe. Thank you so much uh, for that really thoughtful uh, land acknowledgement. I'm seeing a lot of love in the chat there. Um, and, and definitely these land acknowledgements, they're, they're crafted individually. And the time that you've taken, obviously, on this, Carla, it, it shows uh, in the consideration. So thank you so much. Um, so uh, again, my name is Lee. I'm the uh, talks coordinator here at jack.org. Jack um, so again, want to welcome everybody uh, to the session today. So I'm going to kick us off uh, with, you know, what do we do at Jack.org? Why do we do what we do at Jack.org? But before I get into that, I do want to say, please feel free to include any questions in the chat right now. Um, I'm going to be looking through as we go along in the presentation and sort of collecting some for the Q&A afterwards. Uh, if you are open to stepping up and asking your question, I might invite you up. Uh, if you're not totally fine, I can read them for you. Um, but I just did want to say as we go along, if you want to put those questions in, please do uh, as they come up. 
Uh, I also uh, just really want to thank all of our speakers here today and all the folks who have come uh, and spent their time, spent their evening presenting for you. Uh, it's going to be a really fun day. Um, so why do we do what we do? So you might be seeing some of these statistics on the screen here. They might be startling. They might be upsetting for me. They, they definitely are. Um, but why we do what we do at Jack.org is because every one of these statistics uh, has the possibility to change. Um, you know, we have the possibility to grow. We have the possibility to change the mental health landscape in Canada. But I do just want to set up where we stand right now. So where we stand is currently one in five Canadians will experience uh, mental illness in any given year. Out of those one in five, only one in four is actually going to be getting the help that they need. So think about that right now. I really want you to visualize that. You might be in a house uh, with five people right now. I don't know. You might have five friends that you can think about sitting around you. One of those people is going to be needing help uh, in this year. Uh, and literally only one of those four will be getting the help that they actually need. So there's a huge gap here, right? And these are actually statistics, uh, I have to remind folks, that we, we actually got before COVID. Uh, so we have to consider that at this point in time, it might actually be a little bit worse than this. And lastly here, Suicide is the number one health-related cause of death for young people in Canada. And that's startling, it's upsetting, um, and again, it is something that we can change. So what do we do here at Jack.org? Uh, Jack.org is the national charity that trains and empowers young people so that they can go back in their communities and they be can become leaders in mental health. They can become the change makers. Um, and so what we do is uh, we run some programs that empowers those youth, uh, you know, trains them in skills, gives them the confidence and the resources to go into their community and make those changes. And so today you're gonna be hearing a lot about these programs, uh, what they are, how you can use them, how you can bring them into your classroom. And you're even gonna see a preview of one of those programs, the Jack Talks program, probably the best one. I might be a little bit biased. No, they're fantastic programs, all of them, and they all have very different use cases uh, and ways that you can bring them into your classroom. So uh, enough of me now. I do want to bring up uh, one of our wonderful partners, uh, Camilla Rua uh, from Hydro One. She is the Senior Advisor of Sponsorship and Community Investment and a great friend of Jack.org's and a supporter of Jack Talks in Ontario. I've had the pleasure of working with her for two years in a row now, uh, and it's been fantastic. So Camilla, please step right up. Thanks so much, Lee, and welcome to everyone on the call tonight. Like Lee said, my name is Camilla Rua, and I work on the community investment team at Hydra One. But also, more importantly, I'm a huge supporter of the work that Jack.org does with young people in this country. It's so great to see so many people tuned in tonight to learn more about mental health strategies and how we can better support young people. There's no question that the past couple of years have been incredibly challenging for everyone. As a proud mother of two young people myself and a person who experienced my own mental health struggles during the pandemic, I could really not be more proud that Hydro One has partnered with Jack.org for a second year in, the, in a row. I'm also part of one of the one in third, one in three Canadians who know a young person suffering from mental health problems as a result of the pandemic. Restrictions on community supports and gatherings with friends and family have taken a toll on all of us and teachers, educators, parents and adults. We've worked tirelessly to be there and offer a shoulder to lean on for the young people in our lives. So on behalf of Hydra One, I would like to thank you for being the rock in the lives of so many during this difficult time when it's also possibly also been a difficult time for yourself. Tonight's Jack Talk is geared at learning on how we can better support young people, team members and friends dealing with mental health struggles. It's our hope that you lead tonight's talk with a better understanding of how to identify with the signs of struggles in young people and in yourselves and more tools in order to access support. We're inspired and honored to partner with Jack.org as they advocate for young people and break down the barriers around mental health. Lastly, I'm humbled to introduce to you all tonight's speakers, Hannah, Carla, and Alexandra. Thank you once again for being here and over to you. Amazing, thank you very, very much, Camilla. 
Um, so as Camilla said, my name is Alexandra and I use the pronouns she, her, and I am a program coordinator for various parts of Ontario with Jack.org. Uh, so I am very excited tonight to be sharing this space with all of you. As Camilla said, you really are the backbone of how we've been able to get through this pandemic. And I hope that I am able to give you some tools and resources that you can use to empower the youth in your life and maybe help them out a little bit more. And to do that, I will be going through our programming. So our programming is broken down into three main pillars. So first, our Jack Talk. It's a 60-minute uh, talk that goes over mental health awareness, and it uses peer-to-peer contact-based education. And this talk covers mental health basics, uh, how to take care of yourself, how to recognize signs and symptoms of poor mental health, and also how to be there for others in times of crisis. These talks are particularly useful because each speaker brings their own personal story to the talk, which allows youth to connect with the, with the actual speakers. Each of our amazing speakers are trained through a six-week program where they learn about safe storytelling, mental health knowledge, and amongst other key topics. So this is one thing that hopefully we can do to you for you is to bring these talks into your classrooms and into your home. So if we just go to that next slide, if you are interested in having a talk for your classroom, we have a pre-recorded talk and a live stream talk. Both of these talks comes with facilitator guides. And right now you'll see um, basically what the pre-recorded talk actually looks like. You'll see various modules and in each module are recorded videos done by two of our really, really fabulous speakers. We have quizzes at the end of each module. And then we also have a section that goes over our FAQs that students may have after the talk. So talks are a really useful tool to start these important conversations and can really help you get the ball rolling, so to speak. Um, and it's extra nice because for you teachers, they basically come with a fully built out lesson plan with all of these facilitator guides, discussion questions, and pre-talk considerations and worksheets. And then our next program is chapters. So we often use talks um, as a way to kind of get youth introduced to mental health and these mental health topics and Jack.org as a whole. From there, many of them become really, really passionate about what they can do to advocate for mental health and how they can make changes in their own communities. And our chapters are essentially groups of youth who come together by way of their community or their school, and they take on various initiatives. These groups may create goals regarding mental health education, stigma reduction, advocacy, or just building a sense of community, which we all know is so incredibly important right now. And through our chapters, we offer training, funding, and support. So part of my job is to actually meet with all of these chapters one-on-one -on -one and really see what I can do to help them succeed and thrive. And students really say that their confidence in talking about mental health increases, their leadership skills increases, and their ability to create community increases through the work that they do as a chapter. And hopefully starting a chapter at your school will you know, lessen some of the burden on teachers when they're trying to create that sense of community. And as I said, program coordinators are there to help you every step of the way. And some teachers have even gone on to actually embed chapter work into their classrooms um, and into like their lesson plans. And then our last major piece of programming is our summits. So, if you can just go to the next slide, please. Uh, these summits are conferences dedicated to build youth advocacy and leadership skills in regards to mental health. And they also act as a really great networking and bonding time for people who are passionate about mental health and mental health advocacy more specifically. Throughout the summits, we have workshops, keynotes, panels, collaboration discussions, and if you find that youth are really interested in this part of our program, you, you can hold these local summits um, at your high schools, at universities. Um, and we actually just finished our national summit. It was so phenomenal to be a part of that experience. And I just wanna show you this really quick um, video of some of the things that uh, happened there. I don't 
think there's any sound. We've tackled stigma, started conversations, changed the youth mental health landscape forever. Bienvenue au 10 de plus. I'm here because I want to have my voice heard. And we're here to do the work. Foster a safe space. We're here to gain momentum, to inspire real change. Give them the connections, give them the tools. I know they're ready for me. All this sounds so me like I got spaghetti on me. Pockets full, yeah, like I got confetti on me. I'm trying to do it for the people with their lowest moments. So if you want that, I feel excited, empowered, and hopeful for the future of mental health in Canada. It's unreal. In the next 10 hours, I will make every youth feel empowered at this summit. In the next 10 months, I will be piloting Nunavut's first mental health surveillance system. In the next 10 years, I'd love to see more equity, more stories, and truly reaching mental health for all. I will work to improve the standard of mental health care. I will learn more about underserved communities and the tools that they need to succeed. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the next 10. Mental health advocates, we never stop. We've had a decade. Perfect, thank you. Um, so yeah, our summits is, um, it's a phenomenal experience. I can't recommend it enough. I've seen some people commenting on it in the chats of how wonderful of an experience it, it is. So those are basically our three main pillars of programming. But our next program is Be There and is something that's a little bit newer. Um, and I do just have a bit of a checking question just to make sure that we're all here and still paying attention. Um, so my question, and I will launch the poll right now, is have you ever helped somebody in a crisis situation? Yeah, I'm seeing the answers come in right now. This is phenomenal. Yeah, perfect. So. Through this, um, we see that 83% of people have actually helped somebody in a crisis situation. And from our own research, this is actually exactly the same um, that we've found is that 83% of youth say that they've supported a friend struggling with their mental health, yet only 39% of them say that they actually feel prepared for these conversations. And we feel that it is really critical to change this statistic. So our new, uh, our Be There program is a resource for people to learn how to be there for others in times of crisis and also how to be there for themselves. So through this, we offer workshops where students will learn to identify signs of mental health struggles and understand and apply our five golden rules. Uh, Hannah will be giving a little bit more information on what these are and how they can be used in classes at home or in your community. And we have also just launched our Be There certificate in partnership with Lady Gaga's Born This Way Foundation. I take the opportunity to name drop her regularly uh, when it comes to this. So the certificate is free, it's self-paced, it's an online course designed to increase mental health literacy. It only takes about two hours. It's available in French, English, and Spanish, and learners will understand how how to recognize the signs of struggle, what to say to how, what to say when you're starting those tough conversations, how to build trust and offer practical support, tips on how to become a better listener, the importance of setting healthy boundaries, how to help someone access professional and community resources, and how to maintain your own mental health. Uh, some teachers have already been able to use this certificate as a lesson plan in their classes, and it's really, really useful. And then the final program that I'm going to talk about is our Jack Originals. So this is a creative project that aims to create engaging and approachable mental health content for the general population. We have videos on men's mental health, eating disorders, borderline personality disorders, addictions, and more. And this one, um, this is one that I will actually give you a preview of, and it heights, highlights Jay, one of our youth, and their story about their journey to self-acceptance. So I was 14, 
and I remember we were getting ready to do a dress rehearsal for our dance team. I was, you know, changing in the, in the washroom with other guys, and I remember the shirt wasn't fitting right. And I looked at myself in the bathroom mirror, and I started to cry. And I remember running away from our practice area, going up to our chapel in our high school, because um, it's a Catholic high school, and I just remember feeling so ugly and so unwanted and like worth nothing. That's just one of the first moments where I felt truly um, alone. Hi, my name is Jayla Gatsby and I am from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada and I identify as a Filipino gay cisgendered male. And this is my story. So Jay's story is really phenomenal and we're able to draw upon youth from our network who share stories like this um, and it just creates a sense of understanding, community, belonging, um, so that youth can be seen um, and know that they're not alone in the situation that they're going through. So each of our Jack Original videos are there to hopefully help change attitudes and behaviors by publishing educational content and stories from our network that highlight the obstacles Canadian youth face, both culturally and systemically, in the pursuit of better mental health. And these videos are a great option to show in your classrooms and then use them as a jumping off point for discussions. So with all of our programming now officially covered, I am going to stop talking and I will pass it off to Hannah. So Hannah has been working with educators, children, youth and their families over the last several years to provide mental health support and treatment that is informed by research and evidence working with organizations such as Jack.org, of course, Kids Help Phone, uh, Herbert Carnegie, Future ACES Foundation, and Frontier College. Hannah specializes in creating positive learning environments, both at home and in schools to foster well-being and creativity. She also conducts research with Sunny Brooks Research Institute's Family Navigation Project on the effectiveness of youth and family mental health services. And in her free time, Hannah can be found exploring national and provincial parks with her dog, Rain. I'll pass it over to Hannah. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and hello, everybody. I am so happy to be here with you today. Um, as Alex mentioned, my name is Hannah Laird, and I'm a youth mental health advocate and Jack.org talk speaker. So before we really get into what I'm here to talk about today, I think it's really important for all of you to know about why I'm so passionate to have conversations like this one on mental health. So when I reflect on my childhood, I have very happy memories of traveling with my family. Um, I used to go to all of these different summer camps. I did really well in school, and I spent all my free time playing sports. It was my identity, it was who I was. When I got to high school, I started to feel disconnected from all of these different parts of who I thought I was. I pushed myself though to maintain this identity um, by throwing myself deeper into things. So I was a straight A student, I loved science. I was captain of the softball um, team and played field hockey. I had a really great group of friends and I spent my free time volunteering with vet clinics, humane societies and children's hospitals. So on the outside, I made it look like nothing was wrong and I was happy and involved in my activities. But deep down, I felt a really heavy sadness um, and experienced a lot of chronic suicidal ideation. Eventually it all became too much for me to handle though. Um, I started to feel a lot more anxious about leaving the house. So I started to miss school and this also distanced, distanced me from my friends. And at the same time, I was experiencing severe panic attacks for the first time. And so it made any test writing really difficult um, or anytime I had to do any form of presentation, I just, I couldn't cope with it. And so ultimately my grades dropped. Um, I started to self-harm and I disconnected from everybody in my life. As a young person that was struggling with mental health issues, I often came off aggressive or angry. And then a lot of people in my life felt like I was just being the typical angsty teenager, which might've been part of it, but not all of it. Um, however, this is a really big sign that a young person is struggling with their mental health. 
I was lucky enough that some of the teachers in my high school uh, noticed that I was changing and some of these behaviors were changing. Um, and so they connected me with the school social worker. But the only problem was I had no idea how to talk about mental health. I didn't have any mental health vocabulary to articulate what I was feeling. Um, I didn't know how to explain how I was feeling. And I was also scared that if I told them that they would either tell my family or you know, send me to the hospital. So I kind of decided to keep quiet. I kept my head down and graduated high school to the best of my abilities. And uh, this was until university. So I moved away from home into residence and I had to get used to having a roommate that I didn't know, um, being independent and facing like really big lecture halls. And pretty quickly I became overwhelmed um, since I had no way of regulating any of my emotions or coping healthily with all these different thoughts and stresses that I was having. Um, and I remember one day everything kind of just built up and it became too much. So I was really far behind in schoolwork. I was missing all of these classes and exams were coming up. So I started to panic. I remember I had, um, gotten plans canceled with my friend and I went to a psychiatry appointment and it just didn't go well and all of these little things they just built up really quickly and before I even knew what was happening um, I attempted suicide thinking I didn't have any other options out I felt like I had dug a hole that was too deep and there was no way out um, I'm lucky enough that I woke up in the hospital six days later to see my parents and my brothers sitting around me and they were all very upset obviously um, and it was at this point that I knew that I had made a mistake because I never shared with them, my friends or my school counselors, what I was experiencing. When I was released from the hospital, I realized how powerful it was to have people supporting you. My parents helped me find a therapist, a psychiatrist. I received my psychiatric service dog, Rain, which you can see um, on the picture. The, the first picture that you see is him as a puppy on the day that I took him home. And then a year later after that is actually when we graduated. Uh, when I look at myself in the first photo, however, which was kind of just a few weeks before my suicide attempt, I don't even recognize myself. Um, I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping. Um, I was just, I didn't have anything. There was no, I just felt lost. I was just super lost in who I was and what I was doing. Um, so I can't believe how different I look from the first one to a year later, once I got the proper mental health support. Um, looking at these photos side by side, I, uh, they show me how much of an impact mental illness has had on me both physically and mentally. After my suicide attempt, I was connected with the university's accessibility services. And to be honest, I was shocked that they even existed because I had never heard of them before and didn't know how to register for them. Uh, but quickly, my professors received emails from my accessibility services counselor outlining some new accommodations to make school a little bit easier. This included things like a flexible due date, writing tests in a quiet room, getting extended time just to write those tests in case I have a panic attack or anything. And I had note takers in each of my classes to kind of help whenever I missed a class. And these modifications made it possible for me to graduate. And I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have graduated university without them. This process wasn't straightforward or perfect, and there's definitely progress that we need to make. But just re receiving these few accommodations from my professors made everything much more manageable. And I think it's important to sometimes take a step back and ask yourself as youth workers, how can I make my students' life a little bit easier? Uh, it's really impossible to know what is going on in young people's lives. And there are a lot of really big, heavy topics that they deal with. And so it's just easier to um, work with them and see what's going on to help them get to where they need to be um, instead of giving them consequence, consequences for not being able to maintain standards. So now that I talked about that, um, let's talk a little bit about what mental health is. Um, so mental health is a state of well-being, just like our physical health. It can affect our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Um, mental health exists on a spectrum. As you can see on the slide, it isn't black or white. So we all have mental health and our mental health fluctuates on the spectrum as we live our lives. So you can fluctuate from healthy to stressed to struggling to in crisis throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the year. 
And based on where we are in the spectrum, we may need different supports to maintain or improve our mental health. On the other hand, mental illness is a cluster of symptoms or irregular patterns in our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Some examples of mental illnesses include depression, anxiety disorders, PTSD, schizophrenia, eating disorders, or addiction. Mental illness also lays on a spectrum, as you can see on the screen, from no diagnosable mental illness to severe mental illness. And now the main reason I'm pointing these out is it's really important to note that mental health and mental illness are not the same thing. However, they do interact with each other, as you can see by this dual spectrum on the screen. Someone with a severe mental illness, um, so having symptoms that can really impact their life, can still have optimal mental health. Uh, for example, by getting a diagnosis, understanding their mental illness, and having supports in place like therapy, medication, accommodation, that school, and more. All of these resources are here to help manage the symptoms that come with certain mental illnesses. Similarly, someone with no diagnosable, diagnosable mental illness can struggle with their mental health. Uh, for example, if someone had recently had a loss in their family, they may be struggling with their mental health and not have a mental illness. An important thing to remember is that someone can still be struggling with their mental health without experiencing a mental illness. All right, let's move on. So now let's talk about how you can identify when somebody is struggling. And there's three things that you should look out for. These include changes in thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. I've been mentioning those three quite a bit in this talk um, that are intense, long lasting, and significantly impact your daily life. So we all have tough days or sometimes we just, we feel upset, distressed. We can't, we can't do what we have to do. Um, but when you're struggling for an extended period of time under significant distress and it impacts your daily life, this is a sign that you are really struggling and could use some help. And lastly, we consider someone to be in crisis whenever there seems to be a risk of harm to themselves or others. So in this case, emergency services should be called. And if you think someone might be experiencing a crisis, you can identify the risk of harm by asking some really direct questions, even though they might feel a little bit uncomfortable. And these include things like, are you thinking about um, committing, or um, are you thinking about suicide or hurting yourself? Um, and if the person says yes, then you can call emergency services and stay with them until they get there. Um, and if they say no, just it would always be good to show that you care and give them some resources and people they could go to for support. All right, so now let's look at how, um, how the different factors in people's lives could be impacting someone's mental health. So you see on the screen that we break it down into three sections. The first one at the core is you. Um, we have the characteristics that make us who we are. They can include things like our age, gender, race, sexual orientation, genetics, and more. Uh, a good example of this is some people may have a more of a genetic predisposition to mental illnesses, and that means it might be more likely to, for them to receive a diagnosis. Moving on to the next one, individual environment and behaviors. Um, the environment we live in and our individual behaviors also affect our mental health. Where we live, our social support, our work environment, our school environment, um, and access to mental health services all play a part in shaping whether or not we will struggle with our mental health and to what degree. For a lot of youth, a lack of social and educational support can cause them to feel isolated and alone. Um, I know that was one of the main things for me, the main issues for me. I had all these different moving pieces going on, um, but I just didn't have that one support that I knew I could go to and, and depend upon. Similar for adults, if you are working in poor working conditions, you are more likely to experience anxiety every day, and this in turn can lead to mental health concerns. And lastly, the broadest one is factors within our social environment, uh, as well as the structures that target and unfairly impact whole groups of people. Um, this is also known as discrimination. It can include things such as norms, barriers about mental health, race, gender, and many other areas. It is a cause of distress for those who experience it regularly and repeatedly, and also is something that we have the power to change. 
Uh, this discrimination can also be reflected in our systems, such as in schools, which then causes systemic barriers, which hurt certain groups. When we look at this diagram in full, we can see that mental health is complex. There are a lot of factors that in interact with each other. Um, and we have different levels of control and influence on each of these factors, especially when considering our rules. So being familiar with these factors can be really helpful when thinking about what could be happening in a young person's life. But before we go on to how you can support youth through mental health struggles, it's really important that we take some time to stop and say, how can we take care of ourselves? Um, as teachers, youth workers, um, you know, mentors for youth, um, it's really important that we have the capability of taking care of ourselves so that we can give um, to our students and to the youth. The first step of taking care of yourself is doing check-ins with yourself. So you need to look out for what it looks like when you're not feeling quite well, so that when you notice this, you can take a step back and easily identify that, okay, we're struggling here, I need to intervene and do something. So this looks different for everybody. For me, I start to become more quiet. I distance myself from people a little bit more. I spend a lot more time in my room. And so when I start to notice these signs, it's kind of when I'm like, okay, I need to stop and check in with myself. The next step is do what you need to do, which kind of sounds straightforward, but sometimes can be the most difficult step. Uh, doing things that can build up your self-esteem in a positive way can ta uh, help tackle some of the negative aspects that come with mental health. Um, in the comments, I would love for you guys to all write down some of the things that you guys do to fill yourself up, and maybe you might even pick up a new one or two. Um, I know I love to do art. I have an art journal that I add to every time, whether it's, you know, something meaningful or just, uh, just something random. Art has been a really great way for me to express myself. And the last thing that we need to consider is seeking help when we need it. Um, and this sounds easy, but might be the most difficult step because sometimes it can be difficult or nerve wracking, or we don't have the vocabulary, like I mentioned earlier, to kind of express what we're going through. Uh, a really good suggestion I have is having a list of people and resources that you can go to um, when you need help um, or when you need extra support so that just in case anything happens, you have that list you can go to right away. All right, so we're gonna move on to the big, the big be there five golden rules. Um, so these are numbered in a specific order, which you'll see on the screen in just a minute once the slide changes. Um, but you can pick and choose when to use each one. You don't have to use them in the order. You don't have to use every single one of them. And let's go through it so that you know which ones to use and when. So the first one is say what you see. So if you notice someone who might be struggling with their mental health, you can mention to them that you've noticed changes in their thoughts, feelings, and behavior, uh, but make sure that you stick to the facts and to what you see without making any assumptions. So for example, if you have a student who has recently started missing a lot of classes, a good way to approach them and start this conversation could be something along the lines of, hey, I've noticed that you haven't been coming to class as often, and I just wanna check in and see if everything goes okay. So instead of saying like, you've missed five classes in a row, you're gonna get detention. We kind of twist it. So it's like, I'm here for you if you need it. Just know that I've noticed these behaviors. Um, and if you need anything, I'm here. And that brings us into the next step, which is to show that you care. And this can be done in a few ways. You can kind of think about doing small changes like changes in the way that you're talking to somebody, your body language, the actions you're doing, uh, and just by straight up telling somebody that you care for them. Sometimes simply knowing that there's one person out there who cares about you uh, can really make the world of a difference for someone who is struggling. So going back to our previous student who hasn't been coming to class as often, you could say, I just wanted you to know that I care and I'm here for you. Even if the student just shrugs and walks away, it still, make, stay, still may make a world of a difference for them knowing that someone is there for them just in case they need it. Number three is to hear them out. As teachers, we need to open up space for students to speak, ask questions, and make sure to provide silent pauses so that they can collect their thoughts and comfortably answer. Ask what they need from you in that moment and how you can best support them. Don't assume what they're looking for. Um, let them tell us what they need. And if they don't know what they need at the time, just, just go back to number two and remind them that you care. 
Uh, and this leads to knowing your role. I know personally, I've always wanted to fix other people's problems. And although this is because we care, we can't always make everything better. Um, we are not professionals nor therapists. And this is why our last step is to connect them to help. So whether you refer them to the guidance counselor at your school, another teacher who may be closer with them, some of their friends, community resources or more, showing them that they have the support system is crucial. And at this point, I would love for everybody to take some moments to write down some of the resources that you refer your youth to when you notice someone is in need. The idea here is that we wanna build a collection of all these different resources that people commonly use so that you guys can have a few more new resources going forward. And that is all from my end today. I want to thank you all for listening and for Jack.org for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, and now I'm going to pass it on to our teacher engagement lead, Carla Sutton. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you so, so much. That was my first time hearing Hannah speak and I know I'm blown away. Um, we're so grateful to have you here, Hannah. Okay, so um, like Hannah mentioned, I'm Jack.org's teacher engagement lead. So this is fairly new work um, at Jack.org. So while, you know, occasionally Jack.org puts on events like this where we, you know, adapt our programs um, a little bit so they're more relevant for adult allies such as yourselves in the audience, our programs really are first and foremost developed with young people in mind, developed for, you know, with young people as the end users, if you will. But we recognize that um, there's another group of people that often use our programs. They often pick up our programs and ultimately benefit from our programs and that's teachers. So this, this section here is for all the teachers in the audience tonight or the educators. Um, my role at Jack.org is, like I said, it's fairly new. We're in, in the new stages, but it's to um, better understand what teachers need when it comes to educating their students about mental health. Still with the ultimate goal of educating young people, but um, doing so in a way that's a bit more accessible and useful for teachers in a way they, they can just pick up and go. Um, this work um, will also hopefully help Jack.org understand what existing gaps in mental health education exist and where we might be able to fit amongst, amongst those gaps. Um, so like I said, you know, my work here has been understanding what teacher needs are. I've conducted a survey, maybe reach some of you in the audience. Um, I've had some, some great teacher interviews. Um, again, maybe some of you are in the audience as well. Um, and before I get into, you know, some of the really valuable feedback I've gotten from educators around what they need to educate their students uh, effectively, um, I've also heard something else consistently. And uh, that is that these past two years have been really hard. <laughs> so I just want to pause here and acknowledge that, um, you know, being a teacher is hard on a good day. Being a teacher in a pandemic, I can only imagine. Um, and so I know that teachers are struggling too. And so, you know, before I dive into to my segment, I just wanted to say we see you and, and we're so grateful for everything that you do. Um, okay. Next slide, thank you. So um, I thought it would be interesting to share with the, the educators and others in the audience tonight what we've heard so far throughout this research. A, because I think it's, um, it's interesting and it's a snapshot into some of the areas that Jack.org is planning to explore. Um, but also if, um, if you see these and you're like, no, that, that doesn't resonate for me or this sounds like a bunch of baloney, I wanna hear from you because I'm not, certainly not the expert when it comes to teachers and their lives. I'm, I'm not a teacher myself. Um, and so I'm gonna share my email address and I, and I welcome um, folks to reach out to me, um, whether you wanna just be kept up to date on this work or you have your own thoughts that you'd like to share on the matter. Um, absolutely welcome that. Um, okay, so after 160 survey responses, um, close to 30 one-to-one -one interviews with teachers, uh, specifically in Ontario, the, the interviews took place. Here's a snapshot of some of the themes that have started to emerge. A really big one, I don't think it's gonna surprise anyone. Um, time, <laughs> time is a major, major factor for teachers. Teachers are busy, busy people, and they're overwhelmed, um, you know, especially now, like we've talked about. 
there's a lot of expectations, um, curriculum or otherwise, and a really finite amount of time. Um, teachers don't have time to sift through, you know, a ton of resources because there are quite a few mental health education resources out there. Um, they don't have time to, you know, spend a lot of focused time navigating the resource and determining how to apply it to their class. Um, yeah, I, I'm kind of learning that teachers want to spend a lot of time doing this, but you know, they want to spend time creating comprehensive and, and thoughtful lesson plans, but there's not always time. Um, so ideally, you know, we could offer resources that are well built out. Um, they're credible. They can be relied on for safety and up-to-date best practices, um, but they're also flexible. Um, so they can be adjusted to meet the unique needs of your, of your students and, and your class. The second big one I'm hearing is, you know, teachers want, teachers want to know how, how they can do this, this um, how they can educate their students about mental health effectively. Teachers ultimately want to reach and connect and have authentic and meaningful conversations with their students. So not only are, you know, ready for class resources important, they also need to keep up with kind of the ever, ever evolving appetite of young people. The shortening attention spans, um, I know I certainly love a short video these days, uh, the rapidly changing pop culture, that type of thing. And finally, and again, these are broad strokes. Um, the big theme, you know, the third big theme that I'm seeing is talking about mental health can be hard. It's still hard. There's still stigma attached to it. Um, it still feels like a sensitive subject for many, understandably so. Um, and a lot of a lot of educators and you know people in general are afraid of doing it wrong. Um, and and many educators feel ill-equipped to have the conversations. And there's there tends to be this thought that you know I have to be an expert, I have to be a therapist in order to even broach this conversation. Um, so those are the three broad strokes that I thought I'd share with you this evening. Again, uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of you as an educator. So if any of that sounds way out in left field, I would love to hear from you. Um, we'll just pop to the next slide. Ta-da. So if you're interested in learning more about this work, um, or if you just want to be kept up to date on where this goes, like I said, we're in the, the early stages. Um, or if you have something you'd like to say, you can email me. Um, this is my email. It's fairly easy to remember, carla at jack.org. And I would absolutely love to hear from you. Next slide. Okay, so uh, if you can believe it, we're nearing the end of our time together. And so you might be wondering, okay, wow, I heard a lot tonight. <laughs> now what? Um, well, I'll, I have some suggestions for you. Um, if you'd like to be kept up to date on what Jack.org is up to in general, you can follow us on socials. Uh, one of those that we frequently update is our, our Instagram as well as our Facebook, but um, we have a very active Instagram. Um, so feel free to check us out there. Um, you can organize a Jack talk for your classroom. So bring in someone like Hannah to speak with your students. Um, and like Alex mentioned, we have some really wonderful regional coordinators who will support you at each step to bring that Jack talk to your classroom. Um, option number three, you can complete and share the Be There certificate. So like we've talked about, the Be There certificate while developed with youth in mind as the end users, these Be There golden rules are applicable to people of any age. Um, so jump in there, complete the Be There certificate, feel a bit better about supporting someone who might be struggling with their mental health, and then share that with, with your peers. And hopefully one day we'll all just feel a bit more comfortable having these conversations with one another and looking out for one another. You can also start a Jack chapter uh, at your school. So Jack chapters are youth-led mental health clubs that we support at Jack.org. Um, like Alex mentioned, you get coaching and funding from a Jack.org staff member. Um, and it's a really great way to start the conversation in your community and do so in a way that's youth led and, and um, youth driven. And then finally, we've talked a lot about what Jack.org can offer, many of, many of which, all of which I would say, um, are free. So share these resources with, with your colleagues and friends. Um, yeah, bring them on board, the more the merrier. And I 
think I'm going to pass it to my friend Lee. Oh, what a roller coaster we have been on, folks. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Eric, for throwing that in there, the jack.org slash resources. You can check that out. Uh, lots and lots of information in the chat there. And we've got a couple questions as well. But before we get into that q and I just want to say, show some love in the chat for our wonderful speakers today. Um, all of them, Camilla, Alex, Hannah, especially, you know, I was okay, I'm pretty sure. But uh, <laughs> thank all of you as well for coming today. Um, we are going to hop into things. But before we do, I just do want to stress, if uh, folks are interested, please reach out. Uh, Carla put up her email there uh, as well. My email is lee at jack.org. You can also use talks at jack.org. I'll throw that in the chat. If you're interested and want to know more about talks, uh, it's a great gateway uh, into our programs as well. So I'd be more than happy to hop on a call, answer some emails, and chat about the ways that we can bring this programming into your school uh, or even into your youth group. Again, we're talking with a lot of educators, but it's not just schools that we work in. Wherever youth gather, we can be there. Um, so please uh, reach out. But uh, without further ado, let's hop into this wonderful Q&A. So uh, I have some folks who are luckily not camera shy and are ready to hop on up. Uh, oh, I got to let, sorry about that, Camilla. Uh, but uh, who are not camera shy, so they are going to step back up. Uh, just one second. So first up, I would like to invite, all right, one second. Do, all right. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Zizek, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Vizek, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that name. Um, on up, I can find you and uh, give you some permissions to come up. All right, so you should be able to turn on your camera and turn on your mic now. Let me know if you can. And uh, Vivek, you can't? Okay, sorry, one second. Here, me... uh, sorry. Sorry, folks, uh, if you're not used to technical issues on Zoom by now, I don't know where you've been. Uh, and actually, I consider you one of the lucky ones. Uh, so just give me one moment here as I change some of the permission settings here. I am the impromptu tech guy at jack.org. As you can see, I probably shouldn't be. Uh, one sec. Please, come on. Yeah, maybe that. Oh, wait. So I just asked you to unmute. Uh, let me know if that works. Well, I think yes, it, it works, but the camera isn't working yet. But that's okay. I could just be audio if you prefer. Oh, maybe. I think the camera's working now. There we yes, go. There we go. Hello. Success. I love it. I've earned my paycheck. All right. So please uh, ask away. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, you know, I the question that I that I asked uh, it really made me think uh, from what Han, Han was share, Hannah was sharing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm 53, my kid's uh, 25. So we've, we've uh, she's been through school and a lot of it was very challenging for her, very traumatic. And I hear that, uh, Han, I hear from, from what you said that you didn't receive a lot of the supports that you wish you had. And I, I wanna know for, uh, from you and from anyone else else wants to share as well, what would you have, what did you find that maybe teachers did that wasn't so helpful for you and what could they have done? What, wish, what do you wish they had done? Um, to help someone like you, who maybe you didn't have the, you know, you didn't have the, like you said, you didn't have the, the self, uh, the language for it. Um, you didn't really know what even to say or what even to ask for. So in a situation like that, how do you feel like you could have been guided more? Because I work with a lot of young people myself and, uh, and with a lot of parents. And so I would love to learn that from you. Yeah, so, definitely. Thank you so much. Go That's ahead, a great Anna. question. So um, first of all, I have to like give it out to the educators because I've had great teachers. They've made huge impacts and this is a new territory and it can be really scary for them as well because they don't wanna step over people's boundaries and there's different regulations. So um, I totally get that there's this, you know, there's these, these barriers that exist. Um, I would say, so in high school, I definitely give props to the teachers who spoke up um, to my guidance counselors um, to say that something was going on uh, because that really led to some more extra support um, from the school, even if I didn't really let them help me the way that they could have. 
Um, but there were instances um, that, you know, for example, I remember one time I was, I was doing this verbal exam where it was almost like a debate. And I was in this group and everybody was super strong speakers. And I was, I just panicked. I, I completely lost it. It was one of the first times I had such a severe panic attack. I thought I was going to die. Um, and so I just kind of got up and ran out of the room. Um, and instead of kind of dealing with it in a different way, you know, the teacher at first kind of chased me down the hall. Then when she realized that, you know, I needed some time, um, I took the time and I came back. But when we came back and we started talking about some solutions, um, ultimately, it was, let's just try it again. Let's just put you in the same situation. Um, and it wasn't really, that wasn't really helpful for me. So I think something like, okay, so what happened that made you feel this way? Or just kind of sometimes asking, okay, so you had this reaction or you panicked during this test. So what was it that, that you know, you needed or what could I do to need you? Um, I think it's one of the five be their golden rules is just, you know, you show, show you care. Um, don't tell them what like you think, you know, give them space to answer your questions um, with how they want um, and let them tell you what they need instead of just, you know, kind of guessing what they need, which is oh, another opportunity to take the exam, but maybe not because every student's different. Uh, as an introvert, those exams were not great for me. Um, so I think just working with individual students to meet their needs, their comfort levels is really important and something that teachers could have done. When I talk, think about university, um, that is a whole different ball game um, in itself. And definitely, you know, I could go on for a really long time, but um, professors are old school or some of them are old school. Um, and I've had instances where they straight up told me that I was faking my mental illnesses so that I could get accommodations. And um, as much as it sucked, I was able to stand up because Jack Goddard told me how to do that. Um, and I stood up for myself, but just know that it exists and it happens and it's something that we need to work towards. Thank you so much, Hannah, for that really, really thoughtful uh, response. And, and I think one of the key takeaways that I had from that is, is just ask them what they need. I think so rarely uh, does someone come to us as youth and say, what do you need from me? They're constantly being asked, what can you get me? You know, when's that assignment coming in? How are you doing this? You know, a lot is asked of them, but how often do you, uh, you just get to say, what do you need from me? So that was really, really thoughtful. And I think uh, something that whether you're an educator or just communicating with other people, that empathy is so important. Uh, did anybody uh, else want to add on to that, uh, to that question? Beautifully said. Well said. All right. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Cool. So moving along, uh, we had Joni uh, who wanted to step up. Also, folks, I see a couple of people with their hands up. If you did have questions, uh, just direct them to me first. Uh, we're just trying to vet some of the questions before we bring you up on camera because uh, we don't know what you're going to say. Uh, so if you could send those over to me, you could just direct message me through the chat uh, and then I, I can just uh, pull you on up. But Joni, I'm going to make you a co-host right now and you should be able to unmute and turn on your camera. If not, let me know in the chat, please. I have a whole bunch of extra buttons now. Ah, there you go. That's the power of being buttons, a co-host. You fool. <laughs> fool. Um, no, I, I, I mean, all of you have been really outstanding. So thank you for sharing all of this. This is, this is amazing. Um, so um, <laughs> Heidi Bauer. Uh, no, and, and Hannah in particular. I, I, huh, oh, honey. Ah, yeah. Um, so I am a 45-year-old uh, survivor of depression, anxiety, and ADD, many of which have only been recently, uh, many of them have been recently um, diagnosed, but the, the, the depression, huh, let's not go into the bad old days where um, um, we were all disbelieved, but I think you brought up something really important, Hannah, and you kind of actually address my question a little bit, but, but really it's that, um, you know, a lot, there's, there's all of this wonderful attention on mental health now. Yay, isn't it great? And if I take another cognitive behavioral therapy class, I'm going to shoot myself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I got the CBD down. Thank you. Um, I mean that in a nice way, but you know, there's all these great kind of in the moments, take a walk. These are all, these are all wonderful. But when you're, when you see a kid with a chronic issue, you see someone who's like, this is going to be your life. It's for some of us, it is. 
you talk, you know, somebody earlier said uh, you were asking for rep. Well, I refer to them as psych a, a, a psychologist. <laughs> That's great. Um, once you review their bank account and once you review the funding and blah, 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 blah. So for those kids who are looking for a little bit more than situational, what do you do? That's a that's a great question, Joni. No pressure. Uh, <laughs> I know. Well, and then we'll serve uh, and, world and peace. Like I, I, I know. I, I kind of yeah. So so I can speak to this a little bit, and I want to throw it back to some of our our, our other speakers here. I think one of the big things, uh, and one of the things we focus on in some of our programs is mental health advocacy. Uh, so what you're talking about right now is sort of the status of the mental health landscape, right? We have a huge service uh, problem, right? We have. Uh, a lack of a triage system within our mental health services, right? So you have everybody getting in the same line and boy, oh boy, does that line start to get long. And so part of the ways that we try to reduce that stress on the mental health services is by doing preventative care, right? So uh, part of reducing and alleviating the stress on those systems is creating programs where, you know, it's kind of like to me, you know, mental health is like brushing your teeth, right? It's maintenance. Uh, and for some of us, that maintenance comes easier than others. For some of us, we've been taught it when we were younger. And for some of us, we never even owned a toothbrush. Uh, and so what we try to do at Jack.org is kind of come in and introduce some of those maintenance uh, ideas around mental health so that we give people the tools to take care of them. By no means is that fully solving that problem that you brought up. And it's not. Of course, yeah, of course, it, it, what, it, what it is, is it's having the intention to do so. And the other intention is through our skill building for the youth. So when we have youth advocating for change within their communities, when they have them writing letters to their PMs, when they're, uh, you know, going out and uh, doing the work that a lot of our chapters do, campus assessment tools, there's, there's tons of work out there. What they can do is hopefully change legislation and bring in more funds and money into mental health support and care, right? Uh, so what I would recommend though, in the meantime, what we can do with that is educating ourselves. I know not necessarily that there are a huge amount of resource out, uh, resources out there, but educating ourselves on what crisis uh, support exists, what are those lower barrier options for support or psychotherapy or whatever it might be. One of the things we're working on in the Jack Talk is trying to educate people more about how to navigate the mental health system, as that is uh, sort of a big barrier for folks. But I'll, I'll stop talking here. I've given a lot of information, but I do want to throw it to the other folks in the room here if they have anything to add. I know, Joni, like you said, we're we're trying to, you know, go to go to Mars as well, but we'll get and there eventually. And I want to be clear when I say you, I don't mean like, what are you going to do to fix this? I of just course. mean like, what does one do? Because, you know, the... the yeah. You know, and the progression, and Hannah, if I can make you know, the first time I, I sought help from a doctor, um, they asked me if I, w if I was suicidal. I was 16. I said, well, or if I was in danger. And I said, well, I don't think so because I'm here. Like I'm in the doctor's office instead of, you know, and she went, well, that's the wrong answer. Because that put me on an, on an eight-month waiting list. Yeah. And, I, and right. I'm sorry that that happened. And, uh, and that's that's not that piece. I appreciate when I mean, we're talking 30 years ago, dude, like don't even. But 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 there's the program, like there's the hope that really is the hope. Hannah is the like the fact that you mm -hmm. were able to receive help by university. Dude, you're 15 decades, you're 15 years ahead of where I was. Like, that's fantastic. We should celebrate that. Now, let's get that down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but that's I mean, that's that's what I'm curious is like, what can one do to help that student navigate those resources? And, and is the trick to pretend you're having a crisis before you're having a price crisis in order to access that? Doesn't that like that's my question, I guess. Yeah, if I could add on a little bit um, to this question. So a uh, great question, Joni. Um, really appreciate it. Um, and I know Lee, you talked about kind of preventative things to make things not happen, but when you kind of, when it comes to, you know, the bottom of it, uh, people are going to experience trauma. People are going to experience mm -hmm. mental illness. There's always going to be that looming issue. Um, I myself have been, have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder as well as PTSD. So it is going to be something I deal with for my lifetime. Yep. Um, but with that being said, it's a trial and error kind of situation. And so having some support, such as teachers who stick with you every step of the way and said, Hey, like, did you talk to the guidance counselor? How did that go? And if I said to you, that didn't really go very well, to be honest, I didn't really feel like I could tell them anything. 
then as an educator or, you know, as someone in a youth, in the youth life, you can say, well, let's try something new. Let's look mm-hmm. up another resource or let's try to do this. And in the meantime, like we're going to work on this and I'm here if you need anything. And essentially the way I view um, like kind of mental health and kind of learning to maintain your mental health um, is you need to build a toolkit and everybody's toolkit is going to look different. And this toolkit is going to be full of coping mechanisms. It's going to be full of support systems. Um, and eventually we're hoping that youth find their way and get these resources um, and find the ones that work with them and stick with them to help the ups and downs of mental health um, of mental health issues. Um, so that's what I would say as being, you know, in some, a youth and, uh, you know, a teacher or an adult in someone's in a youth's life is really just sticking with them and say, being non, non-judgmental um, and saying like, don't, don't give up. We're going to find the right resource for you. Thank oh, you teachers, so much. I hope you're all taking notes. <laughs> Hannah, you should just, we'll, we'll, Hannah, can, Hannah should just manage, mentor everyone. <sighs> All right. Thank you so much, Joni. Uh, Camilla, did you have something you wanted to add? Oh. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you down, Joni. Uh, See, thank yeah, you so much I'll let you question. go. Thank you. Take, yeah, thank you for all of this. Amazing. No, I think I just, I think I just wanted to make more of a comment on the whole normalization that I see in the chat. And obviously I don't work with Jack.org and, um, but I have had like personal deep struggles with mental health, um, for the last, you know, half decade, at least, uh, that were diagnosed. And I think that just normalizing the discussion and like telling people and talking to people about like, this is something I'm going through as well. Um, you know, I had postpartum depression after my kids were born and then I was, you know, diagnosed with depression and anxiety and everything. And like the more and more I get to kind of un unveil that layer of myself, the more and more people will step up and step out and just say, I've had that same kind of struggle and this is how I'm dealing with it. So normalization for me, and again, I'm not in a mental health expert space whatsoever. Um, it's just been, it's just been talking to people. I'm very candid. I'm very open that's my personality. I also understand that a lot of people will harbor that and will not be able to have, be able to speak out about that for their, for whatever reasons that they have. And that's their own story. But I just think that the key to normalization, a big key of it, not the only key is to be able to speak about it as, uh, you know, uh, your own story, sharing your own story with people, I think is, is huge. And then the, the things that people will share with you and then you know, the resources you can share once, once they share is just, it's, it's incredible. So that's just, that's all I wanted to add um, to the conversation at this point, but thanks Lee for, for no, thank you. allowing me. Thank you so much, Camilla. Yeah, exactly. You're sharing your story. As you said, it's yeah. so imp- important and impactful and it's a, a key pillar to the, the the Jack Talks as well is sharing that story. Uh, we actually have a, a, a special guest coming up here, uh, the one, the only, the founder of Jack.org, Eric Widler. Uh, so Eric uh, wanted to, to add something in here. So uh, I'll make you co-host here, Eric, and you should be able to turn on your screen, turn on your mic and step on up on stage. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. And uh, I hadn't intended on coming on tonight. That's why I'm just sitting in the kitchen. Uh, but uh, I uh, I wanted to add something, and first of all, thank you, Hannah, for sharing your your very difficult story. I, I really really appreciate it. But I also want to remind all the teachers that you know a, a lot of what we're focused on is really that upstream education and trying to reach everybody before they're in crisis. Uh, you know, if you if you wait until someone's in crisis, uh, you know it's very difficult. The resources are stretched, all the rest of it. But the key part of our work is to reach all young people with a special focus on those at highest risk. You know, the diverse, uh, underserved populations. Uh, we're working now more to reach more Indigenous youth, etc. But if you can reach all young people before they're in crisis, and and I think uh, to the point that was made to help build your own toolkit, the outcomes are known to be very good. 
And yes, we also have to use those golden rules when someone is in crisis and learn how to guide them and help them navigate. Because when you're in crisis, and I've supported countless people in crisis, you don't really have the capacity to navigate the system, the difficult system yourself. So that's very, very important. But let's try to also reach all young people, educate them about mental health, uh, so that they build their own toolkit, learn how to take care of themselves, and, and really support themselves before they get into crisis. And that, that will have an offsetting effect on the overburdened system while it's getting its act together, so to speak. So I just wanted to thank everybody, mention that briefly, uh, and uh, back over to our wonderful host, Lee. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Eric, for the surprise appearance. Always a pleasure. Um, so I think we have a couple more questions here. We have a little bit more time before we wrap up. Uh, Andrea, did you have a question? I know we have two hands up. I just want to make sure. Andrea and uh, Herbert, you're, you're both good to, to ask a question. And yes, we will be. Uh, it is being recorded. Also, it will be on our YouTube page. The live stream will be available there, but we'll also send over uh, an email to all you wonderful folks uh, with uh, some resources you can use, some of the information we talked about today, and of course, a recording. Um, so please, please, uh, yeah, check that out. Um, all right. Uh, I just wanted to check. Uh, Andrea, Herbert, if you guys are good to ask a question, just let me know in the chat. Um, that would be great. If not, we can wrap up a little bit early today and give folks back some time. It's uh, late on a Wednesday. Um, oh, Herbert, okay, for sure. Let me bring you up then. I'm kind of a pro at this now, so making co-host, boom. Oh wait, there's another button to click. Never mind. There we go. Boom. Oh, it's just a mountain. All right. Oh, there you yes. are, Herbert. <laughs> hey, folks. So, um, yes, my name is Herbert. Um, they them pronouns, and um, thank you very much for coming here. I'm also a Jack Talk speaker myself, so I am. So this kind of material is very, very, uh, like really goes together with my vibe, you know, like I feel it so well. But my question is that um, I am very intrigued with the teacher engagement program at chat.org. Um, I never knew it, it existed until now. And so um, what I do outside of chat.org is that I am a self-employed music teacher. So I run my own studio and self-employed teaching is very common in the music and the arts. And so I would want to know how this program can benefit such teachers in the private field, like teachers who are outside of the uh, public school system, how this can help these teachers, like what kind of feedback they can give, how can they integrate mental health topics into their subjects, like how can it benefit us? Thanks, Herbert. No worries. I, I I'll jump in because I assume this question is is best suited for me. Um, yeah, so this this teacher engagement work at Jack.org is very new, um, and I'm 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 trying to let teachers lead the way for me because, like I said, I'm I'm not a teacher and I actually don't have an education background, so I'm trying to keep teachers involved every step of the way uh, to make sure you know the folks who are serving are the ones who who are kind of making the calls. I will say that our efforts at the moment, because I am a mighty team of one, um, are focused on high school teachers. So within like your traditional school setting, that being said, as this work evolves, I imagine there will be pieces that are relevant for any educator in any space. Um, and a lot of our work, I think at least initially, will be looking at our core programs and understanding how we can essentially extend them like in classroom settings or in one-to-one -one settings with with teacher students you know we have these great um untold stories like the great story we heard from jay how can we supplement that video with something that creates um you know meaningful dialogue between a teacher and a student discussion questions how can we link that to curriculum objectives those types of things so while i don't have a super concrete answer for you yet herbert because um this is the first year we're getting into this work. I'm really hopeful that we'll have some things that are tangible and useful for educators in many spaces. Yeah, for sure. Um, definitely, I would love to contribute this in any capacity. And um, 
I've definitely seen the change between like when I graduated high school in 2013 and right now that um, I'm definitely seeing more of a mental health conversation. Like this is pretty much absence when I was in high school. So um, it obviously can be it obviously can be taken a lot further, but um, I'm really appreciating what I'm seeing so far. Thank yeah. you so much, Herbert. Yeah, like you said, awareness is just the first step and, and we're getting there for sure, but there's so much more work to be done. Uh, and, and thank you for all the work that you do, Herbert, uh, as an amazing yes. Jack Talk speaker as well. Um, so, so kudos. I'm gonna send you back down now. Awesome. All right, have a good one. Okay. And I know that there was an Andrea who also wanted to ask a question. Andrea, if you're still with us, uh, please, please just let me know in the chat and I can bring you on up. I wouldn't want to bring anybody up if they weren't like ready, you know, they're just like their backs turned, they're drinking some water or something. Um, we'll give it a few more minutes here. Um, but while we wait, uh, I do again, uh, sorry, I'll be a little bit more redundant. I'm, I'm being a bit redundant here, but thank you so much, everybody, uh, for coming today. This has been an amazing event. Uh, really, really thoughtful questions from everybody uh, who came up. Lots of really great engagement in the chat. Uh, I also did just throw in a resource there. There's been a couple of folks asking for resources around younger audiences, so that elementary aged audience. We do recommend checking out School Mental Health Ontario. Hey, even if you're not from Ontario, the website doesn't know, you know? So go ahead, check that out. There's lots of great resources in there for younger audiences. Um, so please, please take a look. But thank you again. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Carla. And a special thank you to you, Camilla, and to Hydro One for making this possible today. We really, really do appreciate it. Um, and before we go, I do just have a couple of housekeeping things that I wanted to mention to folks. So we have two really big milestones coming up for Jack.org if you'd like to continue supporting youth mental health at Jack.org. So if you don't already know, May 2nd to 9th is Mental Health Awareness Week. So this is a perfect time to start introducing some mental health programming into your school, into your classroom, into your youth group, wherever it might be. This is the perfect time. It really sets the scene for these conversations to be had. And like we said today, a Jack Talk is a great way to kick that off, whether it be pre-recorded, whether it be live stream, we'll support you with post discussion guides so that you can set the tone. You can start asking some of those questions and starting those conversations in your classroom. Like Carla was saying, you know, it might feel uncomfortable, but we don't need to be mental health professionals to talk about mental health. We can share our stories, we can do it safely, and it can have a huge impact on everybody involved. So please, please, uh, if you are interested, get in touch with us, go on our website, jack.org. You can take a look at more of our, our, you know, more detail into the programs. You can also, did I say requested Jack Talk? Yeah, you can do that on there too. Um, or you can just email to me directly at lee at jack.org or talks at jack.org and we'll get you all set up with one of our amazing program coordinators to walk you through the process. Uh, the next little milestone that's coming on is Jack Ride. So if you're not familiar with Jack Ride, it's an amazing fundraiser that we do every year. It's a great time to get outside, enjoy that well, spring weather, I mean, we're not having it yet, but we will have it then, I swear. May's a different month. It's going to be great. So please, if you are interested, we actually have a special promotion during Mental Health Week where all the funds raised in Jack Ride will be matched. So if you'd like to make a donation that has double the impact to support our work, please consider making it between May 2nd and May 9th. So like I said, during that Mental Health Week, we are looking at any donations brought in through Jack Ride are going to be doubled. So if you want to double that impact, you know, take a look, donate to a team, uh, donate generally, whatever it is, we would really, really greatly appreciate it. Um, so that is all from me. Um, I just wanted to check, did we hear from Andrea? I would hate to miss you. I don't believe we did. Sorry, Andrea. But that's all for today, folks. Did anybody want to say a closing word? We'll leave it at that. Thank, thank you. you for coming. Yeah, thank there you we go. for coming. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening um, and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Bye, folks. Thanks, thank everyone. you, everybody. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.